So, tonight, I will be going over how to efficiently start your journey with Final Fantasy Pixel Remaster. To start a new game, to bring us to our job class selection. So, for naming purposes, I'm just going to go with adjusted names playthrough. Alright. So the game starts you off with a warrior, a thief, a white mage, and a black mage. Other two that are left out are the monk and the red mage. So the warrior is going to be your strong physical attacker and you can uh, take a lot of damage as well. He's going to be your, your frontline guy. He's going to be taking your damage, protecting your other warriors of light. You have the thief, who's going to be your fast attacker. He basically runs off the agility stat, which increases how many hits you apply in one turn. So the higher the agility, the more hits, the more damage. Your monk deals a huge amount of damage while also maintaining a decent amount of speed and can take a little hit, uh, take a hit a little better than your thief. Then we have the white mage, who will be casting your restorative and support spells to aid your party in making battles a little less dangerous, like using the spell blink, which causes enemies to miss physical attacks. Then we have your black mage, who's going to be casting your offensive spells and debuff magic, and he helps give your party a little bit of an edge over the uh, enemies that you're facing. Then we have the red mage. Cast a mixture of both white and black magic. The trade-off is not all of the spells in either category are available to use. You kind of cut yourself off from the highest tier uh, spells later on in the game. So for this playthrough, I'm going to be a warrior, a monk, a white mage, and a black mage. So, after that unskippable cutscene, and then this controls menu, we started off in Cornelia, which is where we can start doing our shopping. So, immediately, that we have an inn here. The inn is where your party comes to restore health for a fee. Each inn in each town is going to increase how much gill per night it's going to cost 
for your party to be healed. We're going to come back to this fountain later because this fountain does hold a slight bit of importance. Here we have the weapon shop. The weapon shop isn't as important as you may think because most of your powerful weapons will be found in dungeons, but early game it's good to stop in and upgrade when you can. Here we have the list of weapons that you can purchase, and down here at the bottom it shows you when your character is cheering that they're able to use this weapon. That check means that their attack is equal to whatever attack that you're trying to purchase. When you see this green arrow, it means that the attack power is greater than what they are currently equipped with. And then when you see this red arrow, it's telling you that the weapon is actually less powerful than the weapon that is currently equipped. As you go on later in the game, you will find that the Black Mage is actually better off using the knife rather than the staff, because sometimes you're not going to want to cast magic with the Black Mage. You don't want to waste MP when you're in the middle of a dungeon, so you, you will be using the Black Mage to physically attack, which is why I believe that the knives are better than the stabs for the Black Mage because it may not do as much power as a staff, but you get an increase to accuracy, which means you will land more hits. It is really easy for the white mage and the black mage to miss physical attacks in this. The white mage can use hammers as opposed to staffs, and I have found no downside for a white mage to be a hammer. So I, I would just go ahead and get your white mage a hammer, Get your black mage a knife, and then your monk can use nunchucks, but the monk is sometimes better just using empty hands. He might get more hits off, which means he'll be doing more damage, just like the thief. Next, we're going to go into our armor shop. The armor shop shares the same importance as the weapon shop early game upgrade when you can, but personally I like to save my guild for something else later on in the game. Now you see here, we have the same thing as the weapons, your characters will cheer when they can equip a certain armor, and then down here you see that you, these armors have weights, which means they're probably going to attack if their weight is high, they're probably going to attack last in the order. The heavier the equipment, and the slower your character is going to be. Pretty self-explanatory there. So next up, we have our... This person will get out of the way. We have our white magic spells. This is going to be your introduction to how spells kind of work in this game. So if you are running a white mage, or a red mage, you're going to come here, and you're going to see that you have three spe uh, four spells to choose from. Now if you choose a spell, you're going to see these three circles here. So this is level one white magic. There are, I believe, eight levels of magic. You can equip three spells per level of magic. So, it gives you four options, but you can only use three. So the three that I usually go with for a white mage is going to be Cure, Protect, and Blink. Now, Cure restores HP. Now, Dia deals damage to all undead enemies but it only damages undead enemies. You do fight them frequently in this game, but the Dia spell does increase in power later on in the game, and it, it does do a lot more damage than it does now. It's more beneficial, I think, to get Blink, Protect, and Cure. Protect you can cast onto one of your other allies to increase their defense, and Blink only affects the caster, 
but it raises the caster's evasion. Blink basically makes it to where if your enemy is dealing physical damage, then it's not going to hit whoever cast Blink on themselves. Later on in the game, you will have access to sort of um, a Blink spell. It's called Invis, but you can actually cast that on other party members. That's also going to become beneficial. So, we use the spell, we put it where it goes in the level 1 magic. Now, th the way you increase your magic level is just by simply increasing your character's level. So, they're kind of like spell break level points where I believe level 8 is when you can cast level 2 magic. I'm, I'm probably wrong on that, I don't remember the exact number, but as you level up, you will have access to higher level spells. If you find that you get to a town and you can't purchase a certain spell, it's probably because your level, your magic level is too low. You could just go out, grind up a little bit until that magic level goes up, and then you'll be good to cast that spell. Over here we have black magic. And for black mage, I find that fire, um, fire, sleep, and thunder are the three best to get. Focus, I haven't had a lot of luck uh, using that against enemies, because usually the warrior and the monk can hit their target pretty well. I don't really see a need for focus early on in the game. So the spells I'll usually get is Fire, Sleep, and Thunder. You don't have to purchase Sleep, it costs 50 gil, you don't have to get it. Uh, you can do with just Fire and Thunder. You don't need to get Sleep, quite honestly, you probably won't use it as often as you think. And that, that finishes Black Magic. Now we're going to go back over here to this fountain. So this fountain right here has this dancer. This dancer, if you ever get stuck anywhere in the game, uh, she will actually help you by singing you hints on to where to go next. Right now she's not going to say anything because I'm not, I'm not progressed anywhere in the game. But if you get to a point where you don't know where to go next, you can come back here, talk to the dancer, and she'll give you a hint as to where to go next. So here we're going to go into the item shop. And these are your basic Final Fantasy items. We have potions, high potion, storing health, ethers, which is storing um, MP, and then... We have Phoenix Downs, which revives KO to allies. Your antidotes for poison, eye drops for darkness, echo grass for silence. These are just basic status ailment things. Then you have sleeping bags, tents, and cottages. These essentially act as like a tier 1, tier 2, and tier 3 portable inn that you can use out in the field. When it says out in the field, it means the world map. last place we're going to visit church if one of your characters end up dying in battle and you don't have a phoenix down or the white magic spell raise you can come here and the church for a fee will bring one of your characters back to life but right now nobody's dead so i don't need to use their services but um when when a character dies they're dead until they're brought back and this is how solo character challenge runs are played. Usually you'll have three of your characters die in the beginning and the character you want to use as your solo challenge run is going to be the one that is kept alive the entire game. So now that we've explained some of the shopping, I'm just going to play through some of the game since they're not going to let me leave now and show you how some battle mechanics work.
Okay, so now we're back on the world map, and I'm going to show you how your party's formation actually does affect the battle. Once we get into it. So, the way this works is you get to choose your um, commands. But once you choose your commands, you choose the enemy that you want to hit. So here, on the left, you see that you have level 1, and then I can cast one of these spells, or two spells, but that 2 out of 2 means I can cast, I can cast the spell, and then that uses one use. Same thing with black magic, so if I wanted to use fire, use an enemy. So now, you go into the menu, and you go to magic, and you choose your black mage. You're going to see that you have one out of two spell uses now. So you're going to need to use ins or others to bring that back up. This limits how much magic you can um, and it adds a little different kind of difficulty to the game. You're not gonna solely rely on on your on your mages because you're gonna want to save. If you're going through a dungeon, you're gonna want to save some of those spells, maybe for tougher fights or the boss. Um, so this is different than how other Final Fantasies are played, where you have an MP cost, you have a maximum amount of MP. This is basically a very very. Um, challenging way to do magic. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is your party's formation. So your party is kind of in a frontline backline formation. It just doesn't seem like it. So your first character go to order. So your first character is going to take most of the targeting from enemies. Your second character is going to take less targeting, but still a decently a decent amount of targeting from your enemies. So it goes most targeted, second most targeted, third most targeted, fourth most targeted. So you want your beefier, stronger characters at the top, and the ones that you want to protect, the ones that you don't want hit by physical attacks often, are going to be down here in these last two slots. So. Magic that affects all party members isn't, it doesn't change the amount of damage they take, it's just about targeting. But if it's an AoE spell, it's going to hit everybody, so that doesn't matter. So that's basically the basics of this game. Um, party formation does matter later on in the game when you have tougher enemies who are going to be probably one-shotting your mages. You're going to want your warrior up front. And the heaviest armor and the best uh, physical attacking weapons because he's going to take the most damage you're going to want him dealing a lot of damage and your support characters are going to be down here hopefully not taking as much damage i suggest since it's very simple early on you just do some grinding in this area maybe even venture up here a little bit more um before you enter the chaos shrine because It is uh, really easy to get yourself overwhelmed in this game if you decide to just kind of breeze through it. Now once all of your commands are executed, the turn order is then decided by character's speed and weight. So you don't necessarily know who's going to attack first. You choose your commands and then you kind of just let it unfold, kind of like kind of like a Dungeons and Dragons turn. So that's about all there is to know for the basics of starting off in Final Fantasy Pixel Remaster. 
and uh, tomorrow we're going to stream, progress, talk about Final Fantasy Origins, and just talk about the Pixel Remaster in general. Thank you everybody for watching, and have a good night.